Hey guys, Tyler here. For decades, humanity has had at least a semi-permanent presence in low Earth orbit, with various space agencies making extensive use of space habitats that we call space stations. In Star Trek, the most frequently featured type of space station is a Federation facility known as a Starbase. Starbases are very large and often serve multiple purposes, whether it be starship construction, scientific research, military and diplomatic installations, etc. But how do they actually work? That is, how are star bases themselves constructed? How can they house so many facilities? And could we build something like them in real life? Those are the questions I will attempt to answer in today's video. Let's get started. First things first, a little real world background. The first launch of a manned space station was NASA's Skylab in 1971 followed by the Soviet Union's Mir in 1986, which was then followed by the International Space Station in 1998 and China's Tiangong stations starting in 2011. Science fiction of the mid-20th century offered some stunning depictions of what we could accomplish, with some standout examples including 2001 A Space Odyssey and, of course, Star Trek. But before we go any further, I do want to clarify something, something that many of you might have already noticed, which is that the term Starbase actually refers to a collection of facilities, not just the space station itself. Starbases can also include dry dock repair facilities as well as ground-based installations. The term dry dock is usually synonymous with space dock, although space docks can also be part of space stations. It, it gets a little confusing. In this video, however, I will be talking specifically about the space stations, and I may talk about the shipyards and the ground installations in separate videos. With that out of the way, let's dive in. One thing that immediately stands out about these space stations, they are huge. Like, really huge. They absolutely dwarf the starships that enter and exit their docking bays, and those starships are often hundreds of meters long. Earth space dock was envisioned as having a total height of over 3 miles, or over 4.8 kilometers. The 2001 reference book Star Trek Starship Spotter roughly corroborates this, putting space dock's height at approximately 4.6 kilometers. At this size, it would be visible to the naked eye from Earth's surface. Also at this size, it's easy to see how a starbase could house as many as 80,000 civilians and Starfleet personnel. But how does such a thing stay in orbit? You know, to some, this may sound like a silly question because, you know, after all, the International Space Station is... Oh. 73 meters. That's... I, I thought it was bigger. So yeah, how does space dock stay in orbit? Being in low Earth orbit, the ISS is in a perpetual state of freefall, more or less, and astronauts aboard it experience 90% of the gravitational pull that they experience at ground level. So it has to use thrusters to keep from descending into the atmosphere. So the answer is quite simple when it comes to bigger space stations bigger thrusters. Specifically, space docks would make use of the same kind of impulse engines that starships do. And by the way, impulse is basically Star Trek's fancy way of saying uh, fusion power. These impulse engines enable sublight propulsion by venting plasma exhaust through the EPS or electroplasma system via EPS conduits. The source of this plasma is specified to be the fusion reactor system, which on a galaxy-class starship is located between decks 23 and 25. It's separate from the main warp core, which uses antimatter, although the warp core can produce plasma that is diverted through the EPS to the power transfer grid. One schematic of Earth's space dock from Stardate magazine also shows it with antimatter engines, meaning that the antimatter core could produce sufficient plasma needed to power impulse thrusters. I won't get too into the weeds when it comes to propulsion because that might also be covered in a separate video, but suffice it to say that uh, the humongous space stations that we see in Star Trek would require lots of energy and 
lots of raw materials. The amount of raw materials is hard to put a exact numerical value on, admittedly, but in my estimation, it would make use of the countless mining operations on asteroids and moons and planetoids and other bodies that undoubtedly exist throughout Federation space. That said, it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, much of a space station's volume would actually be composed of empty space, particularly when it comes to the docking hangars behind those gigantic doors that we see opening and closing in the films and TV shows. According to schematics from Stardate Magazine, as well as the game Star Trek Online, below the docking bay on the lower decks, if you will, are living quarters, a hospital, commercial areas and offices, hotels, recreation facilities, storage, life support, and a communications hub. One non-canon source also suggests that when Earth's space dock was being constructed, United Earth objected to the installation of a weapon system on the station, so weapons were never installed with the station's defenses relying entirely on strong shields for protection. This may be why Earth often needs crewed starships to defend the Sol system, and those starships are usually in other sectors, which is why it takes time for Earth's defenses to come to the rescue. It should be noted, of course, that in canon, we don't know the exact nature of the facilities below the docking bays, uh, nor space dock's true dimensions, so all of this should be taken as just one possible explanation for how these space stations are actually used. Some sources list Earth as Starbase 1, but that doesn't really seem to be the case. In Discovery Season 2, we learn that in the mid-23rd century at least, Starbase 1 is actually a separate space station that is 100 AUs from Earth, twice the uh, distance of Pluto from the Sun, and it also has a crew and civilian complement of uh, 80,000. Or, well, it, it did until uh, it was uh, attacked and occupied by the Klingons during the Federation Klingon War. It was later rebuilt, as we learn in Star Trek Picard. Before being featured in Discovery, Starbase 1 was actually a designation that was originally going to be reserved for one of Earth's first extrasolar space stations in orbit of Berengaria 7. This was to be featured in an episode of Enterprise's ultimately unproduced fifth season. And god, I can make a, a whole video about Enterprise's unproduced fifth season. I should do that. Either way, we learn that by the 23rd century, hundreds of star bases exist throughout the Federation, uh, some of which resemble space dock, while others do not. Star bases such as Deep Space Station K7, Star Base 375, and even Deep Space 9 have many of the same facilities, including docking bays and ports, although they are often much smaller than Earth's space dock. But could we actually construct something like a space dock in real life? Well, one major technical consideration to keep in mind is how these space docks, or these space stations in general, generate artificial gravity. Just as with propulsion, they most likely accomplish this by the same methods that starships use, gravity plating. This gravity plating is admittedly kind of one of Star Trek's more out there technologies, right up there with warp drive. Indeed, more plausible designs for large space stations often depict them as circular or ring-shaped, so they can take advantage of something called centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is an inertial force derived from the angular velocity acting on an object with mass in a rotating reference frame. In Newtonian mechanics, it is described by the equation F equals M times omicron squared times R. A large enough space station that rotates fast enough could generate, theoretically, uh, enough centrifugal force to simulate 1g of Earth gravity. In addition to being featured in other sci-fi like 2001, Babylon 5, and Mass Effect, this circular design has also served as the basis for several proposed real-world stations. This kind of artificial gravity is also a key component of other theoretical designs, like the O'Neill Cylinder, a long tube-like space station concept that has appeared in movies like Interstellar. Proposed by American physicist Gerard K. O'Neill in 1976, O'Neill Cylinders are artificial habitats that would be constructed using materials extracted from the moon and asteroids, and 
one of humanity's early attempts at space colonization. They'd consist of two sets of rotating rings that rotate in opposite directions to cancel out gyroscopic effects, and they'd be 20 miles or 32 kilometers long, connected at each end by rods via a bearing system. While we haven't actually built anything, uh, even really remotely approaching this yet, and there are lots of other engineering challenges to overcome, the physics behind generating artificial gravity are quite well established. There are very few examples of this in Star Trek, in large part because it's much easier to film a simulated artificial gravity environment with a flat geometry rather than a 2001 style rotating space station. In universe, the gravity generated by gravity plates under each deck is made possible by manipulating the graviton, a theoretical particle associated with gravity. We haven't actually discovered the graviton, and it may not exist, but we have a pretty good idea of what it would look like if it actually does. It's expected to be a massless boson with a particular spin, or momentum, uh, that gives rise to the force of gravitation through an energy vector associated with the gravitational field, basically a curvature of space-time. Manipulating the graviton would be akin to generating a warp field and the artificial gravity generator on starships and space stations would, just like anything else, require energy, but it would go a long way to helping simulate a more livable working environment. I've touched on a lot of subjects today in addition to discussing the major elements of what constitutes a starbase, or specifically the space station portion of a starbase. They really are magnificent structures with a unique and iconic design. They really represent the greatest extent of what the Federation and humanity are able to achieve given their sheer size and numerous applications. Hopefully I've done this topic justice in this video. Indeed, just as these orbital installations serve as way stations between the planets they orbit and the limitless space out there, so too does the topic of starbases serve as a launching point for other topics, including starship construction, artificial gravity, propulsion, and more. All things I plan to cover in future videos. Thank you all so much for watching. This is definitely uh, an overview kind of video, but uh, like I said, hopefully I did it justice. As always, I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. Uh, if you like this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you think I deserve it and you want to support the channel even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description below. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.